Terja Carlson, a documentary filmmaker for Swedish television, has been working as a freelance journalist in the Middle East for over nine years. His first film about Palestine, Welcome to Hebron, won much acclaim and led directly to the production of Israel vs. Israel, which is a startling account of the activities of four Israeli peace activists and their relationship with their fellow Israelis and their Palestinian neighbors. I've met these uh, Israeli peace activists uh, for, for quite some time. I, I, I've seen them, and Yehuda Shal from Breaking the Silence is in my first film. Uh, so I pretty soon, you know, when they came to me and told me, you know, you, you will get, you know, most likely funding for another film, I told them quite soon that we should take a close look at the Israeli peace activists, you know, because I think they deserve a lot of attention. What they're doing is very good. And, uh, and, and I, I was quite certain that, you know, it would be a very interesting story because, you know, they're a little bit different and diverse and they have different stories. So, uh, you know, I, 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 in, in, in the film, there is some material from, from way back, from 2003, from 2004. Most of the footage is, though, from 2008, 2009, 2010. But uh, I've been following them for... Uh, for quite a long time. I remember I met Jonathan Pollack from Anarchist Against the Wall maybe the f first time back in 2003. I think to now he's like, I think he's 29 years old. So I mean, he must have been 19, something like that back then. No, I, I knew Jehuda Shaul I, uh, from Breaking the Silence. I, I knew Jonathan Pollack from Anarchist Against the Wall. Uh, I've met uh, Eric... Uh, you know, Eric Asherman, I, I don't know, I, I've probably met him a few times before this. Ronnie Perlman, I didn't know from uh, Checkpoint Watch. Um, so I, I contacted, you know, Checkpoint Watch, this organization of uh, only women, right? And I, I knew that there was one Holocaust survivor in that organization. But I think there already was one film with, uh, with this woman in, in, in that film. And I wasn't sure that I wanted the, you know, the, the Holocaust connection. Uh, and, but the, the, the main reason why Ronnie Perlman ended up in the film is because when we met, she's the kind of Jerusalem coordinator, uh, when we met, we immediately connected. And we had a really good time. And she was very easy to work with. She was very open. She was very, you know, she would pick me up. We would go five o'clock Sunday morning for like 40, 50 times on Sundays. And we would have a lot of fun, like, and we're still very good friends. I, I, I was in, in Jerusalem a few weeks ago and, you know, we had dinner and uh, we did a screening. She came. Uh, so, and Yehuda Shaul, I'm, you know, still in touch with him. But Yehuda Shaul, since he was in my first film, I knew him quite well. And the same with Jonathan Pollack and Jonathan Pollack's brother, Shai Pollack, who's also a filmmaker. Uh, there is one scene of his footage in this film, for example. So I also know him. Today, Jehuda Shaul, the former soldier in Hebron, informs journalists, diplomats and others about the situation in Hebron. If someone is willing to listen, if someone is willing to see reality, I don't have the right not to take him there. The reason why I wake up in the morning and I go to sleep at night, and then the next morning I wake up and still do what I do, is because I don't have another option. Because if I'm not part of a solution, I'm part of the problem. Once you understand Hebron, once you confront Hebron, you are confronted with the most important question. And that is, what do you choose? The land of Israel or the state of Israel? Whether what is important is equality, democracy, rights, or land. And the settlers are afraid that people will pick the state of Israel above the land of Israel. First, you know, the American media, I always say that it's quite sad because the U.S. media is basically completely irrelevant for the conflict in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestine conflict, since the American media is more pro-Israeli than the Israeli media. You know, the Israeli media in some places is very, very good. If you really want to know about the occupation and the settlements and all this, you should read the Israeli media, like the Haaretz and certain TV programs. So, you know, the, the American media, it's, it's like that. When it comes to, like, Swedish television is a public service broadcaster, and they, they, you know, they show a great variety of documentaries, you know, so for them uh, to fund a film like this, it's nothing controversial. Uh, and it's also, you know, the film, 
for me, it has to do with this, I this false idea that you have to be like pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian, which I, I think it's a total misconception. Because my film, Israel versus Israel, you know, it, it, I, I think I managed to convey that message that, w like, if you want to be pro-Israeli, what does that mean? You know, what are you supporting? Yehuda Shal says in the film, you know, it's either the land of Israel or the state of Israel. And the settlers are afraid that people will actually pick the state of Israel, which means a democratic state, you know, standing up for liberal values and human rights and all this. So uh, I think that's, you know, it's completely non-problematic for, you know, Swedish national television to be involved in this kind of production. Uh, thank God. Because again, you know, I, I feel really sorry for Americans because when you look at the media, and you know how the reporting is, it's, it's, it's pathetic, uh, unfortunately. But uh, you know, on the other hand, it's, it, it's not, you ha it look, this film is actually about hope. You know? I, I, I seriously believe that the situation in the Middle East will get much worse. But on the other hand, it's very important not to stay ignorant or be cynical about it, because uh, these four activists create hope. You know, it is for me uh, you know, something really good coming out of Israel that they have these people actively standing up for the Palestinians against the occupation. So even, you know, the media is, is bad, especially in America, but I think now you can see that people are starting to wake up. Like uh, the peace groups, the activists are much better organized. It's quite easy now to, you know, f at the different universities, for example, to find people that have been to the Middle East, you know. Uh, it's, uh, I, you know, it's, it's very easy to pes be pessimistic about the media and the reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I, th but I think that this uh, alternative, independent media is growing stronger and stronger, and it's getting better and better. I, I still think they could do much better, because I, I, I know many of these activists in Jerusalem, and you know, I, I, many of them are my friends, for example, but I, I still believe they could do much better to reach out, because, uh, again, people really want to know about the conflict all over the world, in America, in, in Europe, for sure people want to know about the conflict. It's a very important topic, you know, to stay informed about. So, so I think there is, a, there is this space, you know, definitely uh, on, on reporting and, and news and documentaries, books about the conflict. There is this space to kind of conquer for alternative voices. And I, I don't even consider my film to be alternative, by the way. You know, there's nothing that extreme about, there's nothing extreme in the film. All these characters have been on Israeli television. You know, they've been interviewed in Israeli media many, many times. You know, so this, it's, it's not some kind of, you know, extremist or radical element uh, in that sense. You know, there's nothing unique. I, I'm not the first person to interview Jonathan Pollack, you know, for example, or Yehuda Shaul. So. The other group of people who come uh, through the checkpoints are Palestinians who have permits to go through, to either go through to work or to go through to hospital, to see doctors, to go to pray, to visit sick relatives, to go to weddings, or to go to get permits. So you have to queue at the checkpoint to be able to go to the office which uh, issues permits? I would go with uh, Ronnie Perlman uh, to the checkpoints. She mostly goes to Kalandia checkpoint, which is between Ramallah and, uh, and East Jerusalem, in, in the West Bank, you know, occupied territories. So I would, uh, and she mostly goes on Sundays. And the thing about Sundays is that people go to work, because, you know, Friday and Saturday they have days off. So there will be a lot of workers coming there at Kalandia at maybe 3, 4 o'clock in the morning to go through as early as possible when it opens. So I would, uh, she would pick me up and it's like a 25 minute drive. We would spend two or three hours and I probably went with her during, you know, the f during the three years that I was filming, I probably went with her, let's say, at least 50 times altogether. Uh, Yehuda Shal, the former soldier in Hebron, he's organizing tours for mostly Israelis, but also internationals to Hebron. Most of the times the police cancel these tours for security reasons. And they, it's very obvious they do it one minute before the bus takes off from Jerusalem. And they say they can't, you know, guarantee the security. Uh, but sometimes they, they, you know, they let them through. They can come with a busload of uh, people that are interested. So I, I, I was on these tours, I managed to get on twice. 
but because they were cancelled so many times. But then I also spent a lot of time with Yehuda going to other places in the South Hebron Hills, which looks a little bit different than Hebron City. Not on, none of that ended up in the film, but uh, he's doing work down there as well. I also went, because and they tried to establish uh, a connection to uh, Hawara checkpoint, which is in, in the central part of the Northern West Bank, outside Nablus. It used to be one of the biggest checkpoints in the West Bank. And they went there on a field trip, like 20 members of Breaking the Silence. So I would go there and they, they were having these discussions about being present at that checkpoint much more in that region. None of that ended up in the film either. Yesha Mismach is slowly, slowly take over another dunam here, another dunam here. Uh, from their point of view, this is redeeming the land of Israel, and they'll do it by any means possible, uh, uh, piece by piece. And, and uh, we're trying in some way to help Palestinians hang on and even get some of their lands back. Uh, Eric Asherman, you know, he's doing this olive har harvesting activities. Uh, and uh, so I went with him, uh, especially this time of the year, like uh, September, October, November, there's a lot of olive harvesting. So I went with him maybe 10, 15 times to these places. And then I met him many times because he's, he's giving a lot of lectures. Like if there is especially like a, like a Christian delegation coming to Jerusalem that is not, you know, evangelist, Zionist, Christian, they would probably meet with Eric Asherman. Uh, for example, you know, they get funding from the Swedish church uh, through an organization called Diakonia. Uh, and every time there's some kind of representatives from the Swedish church, they would meet with Eric Asherman. And the same with other groups, from, especially from America, you know, and Canada. Uh, so I, I also went with him to these meetings. That didn't end up in a film, but, you know, yeah. So, on and all, I, I, I spent quite some time with these people, and that's my style. And also the demonstrations. I've been to so many of these anti-wall demonstrations and protests, you know. Sometimes you, you get great footage. Uh, sometimes you get, you know, uh, tear gassed. I was shot once during uh, filming this here in my leg because uh, the soldiers are very aggressive outside this village, Nailin, and they kicked out all the photographers. And I got really angry, so I sneaked through the, uh, the fields. And then, you know, the soldiers, they recognized me because I was the only, only Westerner, or like the only press, only Western press, and I was no Palestinian journalist either. So, and then they recognized me and came after me, of course, uh, but it wasn't nothing serious, but it was the steel bullet. And of course, it's a scary experience when you get someone with an M16, because you don't know whether it's live or not. But anyhow, uh, so I went to, to these demonstrations in Nailin, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 times. There were, you know, at least every Friday. Uh, and also other places like Nabisale, Bilin, uh, all these villages that are being affected by the wall. Uh, so I guess my, my style, because my style of making documentaries is actually to spend a lot of time and keep going back. Uh, the same way I did Welcome to Hebron. I lived in Hebron for more than a year. I would stand at this one checkpoint, because it's about Palestinian school children. So I would stand at this one checkpoint, you know, every morning when the kids were coming to school, day after day after day after day. Uh, and eventually it pays off. You get unique footage. That's, that's one way to do it, for sure. It's actually quite easy to get close to the soldiers uh, if you know how to, you know, play that game or know how to do it. So, and this is what people find quite interesting to see that you can get very close to Israeli soldiers. You know, it's uh, you have the right as a, as a cameraman, as a photographer. Sometimes they will, you know, tell you to turn off the camera, but most of the times, you know, if you communicate with them and and you and you're very open that you're not an activist or you're, you know you look professional, you act professional. You can actually get very close, you can hear their conversations, you know, you can get the, let's call it beautiful shots of them firing weapons, you know, that looks very good on, in the film eventually. So, and, and that, I guess, I'm pretty good at that, that you know, have, finding a way to, so that I can, 
get this 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 footage uh, with the soldiers. And, and also the like when Yehuda Shaul is doing his tours in Hebron and the settlers call him a traitor and they threaten him. Uh, this is also, you know, from just being there, of course, but also understanding the situation. You know, you have to spend time and so you can somehow understand the settlers and how they move. And I also got some great footage from Hebron. Uh, and I think there were like two other guys on that same tour m making documentaries as well. But uh, I ended up getting all the nice shots because they were, you know, did that mistake that they actually followed Yehuda, which makes sense that you follow the character that you want to make. Yeah, exactly. But uh, in a way, you should, you know, focus uh, or try to focus on the action, the potential, you know, danger or whatever. You know, and I, I'm not saying that I'm a brilliant guy that always knows how to do this, but I guess after nine years in the Middle East, I start to getting some kind of sense for these situations. Like, uh, what, you know, it's another thing is it's it's really hard. W one part of like covering the anti-war protest is the tear gas and stuff like that. Uh, what people have to understand, you know, if that this is a military tear gas, uh, it's it has a nerve agent, like a chemical agent. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I got stuck a few times and you're completely surrounded by the tear gas. And what it does to you, it's not only that you, you know, the tearing, uh, you, the coughing, but it also makes you turn very, you know, it creates apathy. Uh, you become, become very vulnerable. I remember once I just crumble and I lie down. Uh, and it's a very scary thing, you know, because I mean, they keep on shooting. So what, what you hear, and the Palestinians might be throwing stones, and you end up being stuck in the middle, completely tear gassed. And people die from this as well. I mean, uh, there was one, one woman a few months ago, she, I think she was pregnant. She died from it. She was like 35. Kids suffer, you know, a lot from this. Old people suffer a lot. So even I get affected. Like it's, so that's, uh, people, you know, they come up with this, oh, they're only shooting tear gas, thank God, you know, it's not live ammunition. But that's the people that never been stuck, you know, that never been tear gassed. Because it's, uh, it's not like some police force would use. It's much stronger, much more dangerous, for sure. So. <laughs> For me, it's, uh, it's a motivation. For me, there's... We can't stop now. You're not afraid? Of course I'm afraid. Okay, okay. You know, the, the anti-war protests in, in different places, like Nilin, Bilin, and these places, uh, they have looked more or less the same for a very long time. Uh, what happened, though, is that, that they, they managed to, in some places, like uh, Nab Nabisale, but mostly like Bilin, Nilin, they are the most famous places, the well-known places. But they managed to organize committees. Uh, you know, it's very well organized with the Israelis arriving. Uh, the International Solidarity Movement, the ISM people, have people staying in these villages, for example. But so the protests, you know, they're getting better and better, and they do this, uh, you know, they put on the Avatar outfit once, or, you know, they would do it in sympathy with the Norwegians after the terrorist attack in Oslo. And they put on these things, right? Uh, the problem is that they haven't really managed to break through in, in the, like, let's say, the Western media, because it's actually a really beautiful thing to get Israelis, internationals, and Palestinians being serious about protesting. It's, people are getting killed, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, the Israeli reaction to this is very violent. They try to crack down on it. They arrest all the organizers. Uh, sometimes they don't put them on trial, but they arrest them and keep them in custody for months, right? And eventually the, these Palestinian organizers would admit some kind of crime that they're, you know, I don't know, posing a threat to Israel in some way or another. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I think they deserve more attention. Uh, and maybe the, you know, the organizers and the supporters could do more with this because uh, I think they're very important. And I think that, you know, the Palestinians are realizing that this non-violent struggle, you know, there's absolutely no arms whatsoever, uh, is very successful. They get a lot of sympathy, for sure, uh, worldwide. But maybe because the Israelis are really arresting the organizers, they should do more trying to, to tell the world and, you know, people should get more focused on this, that 
it's obvious that it's becoming a major threat for the Israelis, how, you know, how to handle the occupation. The Israelis know very well how to handle the extremely violent, the armed resistance. You know, that, that's what they can fight with easily because they have the weapons and the training. But when you get 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds throwing stones and international activists uh, you know, from all ages and from all countries coming in solidarity, because now, like in Berlin, you have s church groups coming there with 40 people. You, know, you have trade unions coming there with another 40 people. You have uh, all these people, you know, from the, even from the consulate sometimes in Jerusalem, they would come to Berlin to show some kind of solidarity. So I think uh, they are very important, these protests, the anti-war protests, but maybe it's time to shift gear and try harder to put even more attention on this. I, I actually come from a background that was, uh, you know, very understanding towards the Israelis. And I still, you know, I have a lot of Israeli friends and uh, all this. So I think, you know, for me to be honest with the Israelis and to be, you know, be a, I wouldn't say supporter, but have respect for Israel is actually to criticize it to be, uh, tell exactly what's going on in the occupied territories, tell exactly what the settlers are doing, and you know all this stuff that is going on because of the occupation. And I think to, to give a voice and, and portray the, the Israeli peace activists, you know, that's one way to do it. Because for me, when you hear Yehuda Shaul talking about his army service, uh, you know, he's very honest, and uh, everything that he told me from Hebron is like, exactly what the Palestinians have told me. And of course, what I've seen for myself living there from the settlers. Uh, and uh, so, for me, it's obvious that the only way for Israel to survive in the Middle East is to be morally very strong. Because if they become just another Middle Eastern state, it's just a question of time before either the American support stops or, you know, any hostile country kicks their ass. Uh, so, I mean, in order to, to stay strong and get the support that the Israelis deserve, they have to, you know, obey to international law. They have to respect human rights. They can't keep on stealing Palestinian land. So, seriously, you know, for me, it's really, really important to be honest to the Israelis how destructive the occupation is. And again, you know, this, this idea of pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli, I think it's completely ridiculous. There is no way people should support an Israel with, uh, you know, settlers burning olive trees every day, soldiers dropping white phosphorus in, you know, neighborhoods in, in Gaza. Why, why would anyone support this? You know, Israel becoming more and more religious, these fanatics, you know, you have rabbis new, now telling people to it's okay to, you know, kill Arabs and, you know, don't rent out apartments to Arabs. You know, why would anyone support this? I just don't get it. Is, is that being pro-Israeli? You know, there was a time where, you know, people that didn't support the war in Iraq were anti-American, right? I mean, that's, you can laugh about it, but it's, and the same with Israel. You know, apparently that you're pro-Israeli as long as you never ever criticize the Israeli government. And if you stayed in, in, in Israel, you know that the Israeli society is very divided. There's a lot of people in Israel criticizing what the government is doing. So I, I think it's time for the rest of the world, and especially the Americans, to you know, connect with the reality. And again, like, be honest with the Israelis and the Israeli government and you know, find out about the occupation. There is one scene uh, during Ramadan when Ronnie Perlman, the woman from Checkpoint Watch, She's talking to these women, the Palestinian women, you know, going through the checkpoint. And after that whole conversation, uh, there is this border police that comes up, standing, stands right next to her and says, you know, one, 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 one by one, get next to the wall. And these, the Palestinian women are like four, four of them next to each other, like it's a big group of people. And Ronnie Perlman asks the soldier, why? And the soldier looks at her, and she says it in Arabic as well, why? And the soldier looks at her like, what do you mean, why? You know, of course he has to tell them to stand one by one. And her body language is very sad. And, you know, she shakes her head like, okay, you know, it's... Uh, and, 
and that I think that's for me because I, I I know Ronnie very well, you know. So I think that's it's a, for me it's a very sad moment. Like, but uh, and also in the same uh, same part, you know, it's Ramadan and you get the people the trying to they end up breaking through the checkpoint and it's just women, you know, being crushed like they have to break through. And this is what happens at checkpoint, you know. It's like. For me, the, the, the best reception so far was at the Al Jazeera Film Festival in Qatar. Because they, they showed something like 300 documentaries. And I didn't know before coming there that this film was going to be the opening film with even members of the, the royal family present at that cinema. So that was a good surprise, you know. Because, uh, you know, this is for Jewish Israeli activists. And uh, having, you know, a thousand people quite a few of them Palestinian refugees that never set foot in West Bank or Israel, in Palestine, whatever you want to call it. Uh, quite a few of them were in the audience. Uh, and so they showed the film as an opening film. Uh, and afterwards, there were some Palestinians coming up to me and saying these things that for us might be completely natural, but it's not so natural for Palestinian refugees. They were telling me, like, it's very important to speak spread information and show this film that we're not against, you know, these Jews are good people. I, I think it's really important for outsiders to get involved. Uh, and it's also, uh, it's, a, it's a conflict that it's actually very convenient as an, as an activist, as a journalist or a documentary filmmaker. It's actually fairly safe compared to other conflicts in the Middle East. It's not like Iraq, it's not like Afghanistan or Libya. So I really encourage people to, you know, go there. It's, uh, if people find this film interesting, you know, it's quite cheap. Both Israelis and Palestinians want to discuss with foreigners. They, you know, you might disagree with them, but they're open. They want to talk to you. <laughs>